So I will be discussing the techniques and complication avoidance in endoscopic pituitary surgery. Endoscopic pituitary surgery is when the endoscope is used as the sole or the only visualizing tool in place of microscope. It utilizes the endonasal route via natural air passages to reach to the rostrum of the sphenoid. It has distinct advantages and it has been proved to be better than microscopic surgery because the volume of exposure is far superior as compared to microscope and it provides better visualization of anatomy, pathology and a panoramic close-up view with multi-angled view permitting to look around the corners. Now if you see this scenery on the left and if your target is this green scenery there, this is on the most left side is by gross or by using the headlight. Now next is when you see with the microscope that it's enlarged and you see more and more details. And the last one is when you put your neck into this window and you look around so you can see everything all around. So this is the difference between microscope and endoscope. Now illumination and magnification of endoscope is unique. It gives a flash light effect. This means that you can study the details, finer details of a structure. If you take the endoscope close to the target, you can see the finer details. So it permits a better distinction between the tumor and normal pituitary and similarly a better distinction between the arachnoid and diaphragm so that you can identify the minor CSF leaks as well. It reduces the morbidity and post-operative course is very comfortable because there is a minimal mucosal dissection. You are not using the hard edge nasal speculum and you are not packing the nose after surgery. So it's very well tolerated and appreciated by patients. However, it has many disadvantages and the most important is that it gives you a 2D image. So there is difficulty in depth perception. But this can be compensated by constant in and out movement of endoscope during surgery. So you fix up some surgical targets and you get a 3D perception. And a bimanual dissection may not be possible if you yourself are holding the endoscope. So you need another surgeon and a binostral technique so that you are both hands are free and you can do a bimanual dissection. And as already told to you that it produces a barrel type spatial distortion of the image. It is not a real image, it's a distorted image and in periphery, the periphery are blurred. It acts as an obstacle in the narrow corridor, already a narrow corridor and where you put the endoscope so it occupies the space. And it acts as a clock gear mechanism where if one component of this fails then you cannot proceed further surgery. So, because of limited space, there is limited maneuverability of the instruments and limited zoom capacity of the endoscope so that the instruments, if you take them deep and if you put more zoom, they may collide together. So use of multiple simultaneous instruments in nasal cavity have a greater risk of requiring excision or lateralization of middle terminate. Thereby, sometimes to create a space, you may have to partially or completely excise the middle terminate. And most important and last is that it's a different hand-eye coordination. It's altogether a different. So this is why there is a steep learning curve. Now, existence of this steep learning curve is there, and this is the time when complications can occur. So complications may be non-endocrine and endocrine. Of the non-endocrine, if we go according to the stages of the surgery, in nasal complications, it's the bleeding or epistaxis, which may be early or delayed. And it is always the cause is mucosal branch of sphenopalatine artery. Even delayed epistaxis is also because bleeding from this artery. Now, anosmia or hyposmia, when you coagulate the mucosa in the upper part of the nasal cavity. Sphenoid maxillary sinusitis, mucosal or synechia and patient presents with symptoms of headache, dizziness and fever two to three months after surgery. Others could be carotid injury which should be immediately recognized and treated by putting a stent and this occurs when the surgeon gets lost and he is not properly oriented. 
So the navigation and Doppler may help you in identifying these arteries. CSF rhinorrhea, which can give rise to meningitis or pneumocephalus, post-operative hematoma in the residual tumor or pituitary apoplexy, post-op apoplexy. The tumor residue may be there, then there may be subarachnoid hemorrhage, blood may trickle into the arachnoid and it may cause cerebral vasospasm and there may be mortality. And these are the three things like uh, meningitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage, residual tumor hematoma and these carotid injury, they can kill a patient if you are not very careful with these. Endocrine complications may be a development of new pituitary hormone deficiency which patient doesn't have, means the normal pituitary has been taken, causing diabetes insipidus and pain hypopituitary. So this microsurgery has been linked to as if you are eating with a fork and knife, whereas the endoscopy is like you have one chopstick in each hand. So it's entirely altogether a different skill and hand-eye coordination. So this is why the learning curve exists and this is the most important to learn at this stage. Now a sudden change from microscopic to endoscopic may be difficult and discouraging. So change slowly and progressively. So initially if you are at present doing sublabial pituitary by microscope, first change to endonasal. Then endoscope assisted with retractor on then with endoscopic without retractor and first do the cellar stage because you are more conversant with the cellar stage and then do the nasal stage and finally all endoscopic procedure, full endoscopic procedure. So this stepwise progressive learning brings confidence and ability to tackle any complication. And it has been proved that with increasing experience there is improvement in duration of surgery, pre-op visual deficits, endocrine remission, post-op hypopituitarism, mucosal trauma, post-op discomfort, hospital stay and CSF leak. And really your post-operative results start showing a significant improvement once you have done 100 cases. Now there may be frustrating experience in first 20-30 cases because of difficulty in the initial phase of procedure, but these can be minimized and overcome by knowing your endoscope, by learning endoscopic skills, by detailed understanding of the endoscopic perception of the anatomy, following the techniques step by step. So every step you identify the structure and follow the procedure, you are less likely to cause complication. And knowing the tips and tricks and this learning obviously needs commitment and dedication. Now about the endoscope itself that all the cables of light, camera and irrigation they should be tied together to the shaft of the scope and they rest on the table on left side of the patient. So they are out of your the surgical field. Now endoscope is held like a flute in the left hand. So you hold it like a flute. Now index finger and thumb they can be used to focus the camera or for orientation purposes. Now he use a zero degree, four millimeter, 18 centimeter endoscope usually in adults. And 18 centimeter is used up to nasal and sphenoid stage. After that, 30 centimeter may be used. In children, we use 2.7 millimeter endoscope because of the space. Now 30 and 45 degree are used at the end for the inspection of the remnants and completion of the tumor resection. An endoscope with external sheath is useful because it permits irrigation and cleaning of lens. It avoids frequent in and out movements of scope, so it reduces your surgical time. Instruments used are straight and long, which are curved at the tip, otherwise you will not be able to see the tip. They should be slightly curved at the tip. The precision grip instruments are always preferred because the power grip instruments you cannot have a control in the depth. Whereas precision grip where your palm rests and then you can use these precision grip instruments. And the suction coagulator is, I find is very important because it, it, it makes your operation clean, easy and fast. After sphenotomy, the endoscope may be mounted on the holder or another surgeon holds it with acts as a co-pilot and to the main surgeon who is a dissecting surgeon and it provides a 3D perception. Now the job of the assistant surgeon or co-pilot is that he holds the scope 
other way like he's on the reverse like a pilot so he is on this side and he holds it like this now he should support his elbows so that for a longer period he can uh, hold the scope for you he stands on the left side of surgeon at head end of the table now he moves the scope in relation to the instruments so a pilot and co-pilot they do a couple dance so if he goes in he follows him. now a scope should always pass above the inferior terminate for pituitary surgery now always keep checking the proper orientation and proper orientation means all the buttons and the scope should be facing the screen then only you are properly oriented if your buttons are on this side this side you are disoriented and especially this should be checked after each uh, insertion and exit of the scope now just to do some in and out movements inside the nasal cavity to just the depth and fix some surgical landmarks which will give you 3d perception now introduce scope slowly like you are going through a tube <coughs> and without touching the wall otherwise your tip will get soiled and you may have to take it out again now avoid quick movements in proximity to the target while introducing escape take the advantage of elasticity of the ala lift or deform the ala like this and keep it at 11 o'clock so endoscope should be kept at a 11 o'clock position avoid injury to nasal mucosa by insertion of instruments by endoscope guided visualization keeping the suction at low setting and if there is bleeding from the mucosa it is better controlled just by infiltration rather than coagulation now instruments introduced taking the advantage of rigidity of the floor just pass the instrument first thing is along the floor so will you will not injure the middle terminate or other terminates and instruments and scope they should not touch each other and they should never cross over try to make the path as straight as possible so if you see a semi lunar signs means your scope is touching the tissue so just rotate it if the lens is fogged just irrigate it with warm saline it will be okay and when you enter the nasal cavity you first get an aerial view of the whole area so that you know what is where now distance between the tip and scope should be 1 cm and never pull a tissue or hold a tissue if you do not see the tips of the instrument now the posterior septal artery which is branch of sphenopalatine which in turn is branch of internal maxillary lies at superior lateral to coana or inferior lateral corner of sphenoethmoidal recess or medial posterior corner of inferior margin of middle terminate this rt can be coagulated when the excess is made between the middle terminate and nasal septum for anterior sphenotomy to prevent bleeding during and after surgery now how to drill you use a drill and drill is first taken through the nostril close to the target when the tip can be seen now make it on touch the target of the drill and give a drill it in the busts like a paint brush now remove the drill only when it has completely stopped dry drilling with burr helps in hemostasis and it stops bony bleeding while drilling keep endoscope away and zoom so that you avoid the soiling of the endoscopic lens now sometimes in between in the stage of a surgery you may notice that more and more blood is coming so this is nothing but a blocked coana effect so what you do is that in between you should keep sucking the coana the blood collects there and then when you manipulate the blood comes up and remove the coffin effect now coffin effect is that you are struggling that there is no space so for that you do a wide sphenoidotomy so you will be very comfortable now angled scope visualizes opposite to the light cable so if you are want to see up then your light cable should be down and then instruments now should pass above the scope now to begin with in the beginning you must select the cases and for a beginner a best case is a non functioning adenoma with a well nematized sphenoid sinus and tumor confined to cella and the worst case is conchal or pre cellar type of sphenoid nematization with a functioning adenoma of agromegaly and cushing because this mucosa in these patients is fragile hypertrophied and it bleeds and the don't do recurrent or dumbbell or giant pituitary adenomas to begin with by endoscopy 
Now always review the preoperative MRI and CT scan for assessment of nasal airway for presence of DNS or a conchabulosa. Anatomy of paranasal sinuses for extent of pneumatization and intra or interspinoidal septum. Sela enlargement, erosion, anatomical variation or kissing carotids, very important. And sometimes you may see a mucosal thickening which may suggest a sinusitis or a pituitary apoplexy. Now, we use a topical nasal decongestants in the form of xylometazoline one hour before shifting patient to operation room and then adrenaline 1 in 1000, 3 ampules in 30 ml of xylocaine is used. The position is supine with trunk elevated 20 degree, knee and hip flexed which provides a easy access to the middle turbinate. Now head is rested either on the horseshoe or in a three pin when you want to use the navigation. Now most important is that the chin forehead line is parallel to the floor. This must be parallel to the floor and there it is a 15 degree turn to wash the surgeon and a contralateral tilt. Now on the operation table we do a super selective packing and in this the two to four cotton patties which are soaked in decongestant and squeezed and then these are put inserted between the middle turbinate and nasal septum. Take them to Kuana and then from anterior inferior to push them posterior superiorly into the sphenoethmoidal recess. Let be there for five minutes to create a space and to widen the sphenoethmoidal recess. Once a space is created, now fresh pattern cortis are pushed back in sphenoethmoidal recess and the rostrum sphenoid sinus and again left there for two to five minutes. And I can assure you that if you spend 10, 15 minutes in this, your next stage of operation will be very smooth. Now, when you are packing the nasal cavity, the bayonet should be opened in craniocordal direction because you will not be able to open it like this and you will injure the mucosa. Pack the one nostril at a time and if you see any synechia, don't cut them by scissors, cut them by diathermy so it doesn't bleed. Oropharynx is packed and propofol anesthesia infusion reduces the bleeding and ideal blood pressure of the patient for this pituitary surgery should be around 90 with pulse of around 60. Now the endoscope is inserted parallel to middle turbinate at an angle of 25 degrees inferiorly to the kuana first along the floor. So you visualize the kuana first and to see this you will see that inferior turbinate points towards the eustachian tube or tubal elevation. Now kuana is the anatomic reference point and now here you go between the septum and inferior turbinate septum and middle terminate and reach to the sphenoethmoidal recess. Now instruments are passed along the septum below the scope through the lower part of the nasal nostril. Now there are many variations in endoscopic pituitary surgery. It may be uninostral or binostral approach. It may be two or four handed technique. So we prefer four handed technique. Extent of resection of middle terminate to create a space which may not be resected at all, partial resection or total resection. But if there is a rule if you have to resect any of the turbinate resect it partially only or leave some part of it because they act as a very important landmark surgical landmarks and type of repair of cella depending upon the CSF leak grade of the CSF leak. So before starting endoscopic pituitary surgery one must know all these modifications so that you can tailor it according to the requirement in a given case. For example, a uninostral approach is very good for in a patient with DNS who has a microadenoma. So why to go on both sides and through the capacious nose, nostril, you can remove it by one nostril only. So a uninostral or paraseptal approach, side which is more is used, which is less obstructed by nasal septum deviation and which is contralateral to enlarge middle turbinate. Now, lateralized lesions, macroadenomas are best approached by contralateral nostril because you have a tendency to go to other side. Now, surgical technique stages are nasal, sphenoid, cellar and reconstruction stage and recognition of important landmarks during each of these stages is the key for safe exposure. First thing is that you lateralize the middle terminate by pushing it with the dissector over the patty without fracturing it or if you still the space is not being created 
then what you can do is you out fracture it medially first and then post laterally so that space is created and this is how it is done. Now neuro navigation is important for beginners when they are just starting for a few uh, 10, 15 cases I always used it for reoperations because your anatomy is distorted you don't know where bone is there what bone has been removed for extended transesthenoidal for distorted anatomy of the sphenoid sinus when it is not a straight anatomy kissing carotids or dumbbell or joint pituitary adenomas now sphenoid ostium marks the superior limit of opening into the sphenoid sinus and if there is a one constant once you have done about 20 25 cases you will learn this that the inferior margin of middle terminate leads to the clival indentation at 1 centimeter below the level of cellular floor and it is a very constant surgical landmark. So, this is why you can avoid and after doing 20 cases you can avoid using the C arm. Now, ostium is identified medial to root of superior terminate in the lateral rostral corner of sphenoid rostrum. In 30 percent cases the ostium may not be visible. So, a observation of air bubble with secretions and probing a loss of resistance it will just uh, uh, locate it very easily. Now, if still you do not find it then what you can do is a thin anterior wall of sphenoid below or caudal to the expected site of ostium that is the 1.5 centimeter cranial to the roof of Kuana. So, there it is a thin bone which is known as fontanelle of sphenoid bone where you can just perforate it to make a artificial septum and this is the septum nasal ostium you see sphenoid ostium a typical sphenoid ostium there. Now, mucosa over the rostrum of sphenoid sinus is coagulated nasal septum is now gently pushed medially fractured and pushed to other side. Now, the submucosal dissection along the contralateral side of sphenoid rostrum is done to visualize the other side ostium and this gives a classical owl eye appearance. So, if you see this, this is the submucosal dissection has been done and the hair the vomer is the nose and these two sphenoid ostia they act as the eyes. Now, sphenoid ostia is enlarged medially and inferiorly to avoid inadvertent entry into the anterior cranial. If you will enlarge it superiorly you may enter into the anterior cranial fossa. Now, rostrum of the sphenoid is removed. Now, a V shaped anterior sphenoidotomy is done from inferior margin of middle turbinate vertically up to the sphenoid ostium for about 15 to 20 millimeter. Now, posterior one third of nasal septum is removed by back vital and this is how this back vital works that you come through the other nostril and you take this and then you just remove the nasal septum. Now, caudally vomer is drilled up to the pterygosphenoid synchondrosis or canal for median nerve which is seen at 5 or 7 o'clock position creating space under the floor of the cella where you are able to pass your suction at least otherwise your instruments will get uh, entangled somewhere with the bones. So, this much drilling should be done and laterally you go up to the crest which marks the junction of sphenoid with the ethmoids and now this is the drilling of the vomer. Now, there is a approach called cavity and half. So, here what you do is through the ostium you open the Parsons bar and then you open the bulla ethmoidalis. So, once you open the bulla ethmoidalis this is used to keep your scope there. So, this does not occupy your space in the sphenoid cavity. So, this is what is called cavity and half approach. Now, smoothen the sphenotomy margins with a diamond drill paramedian septum within the sphenoid sinus they often lead to carotid or optic nerve. So, they should be removed only when it is mandatory and they should not be removed by the forceps they should be drilled with the diamond drill gently to avoid injury. And now once you have removed all this so your scope is out now you have to get oriented and you can still identify the midline by the remains of the rostrum and vomer down. So, you know where is the midline and by staying between the two carotid bulges. So, that is the midline. So, you should not get disoriented at this stage. Now, anatomical landmarks are identified in a panoramic view which mimics the fetal face. In the center is the cella, rostrally is tuberculum celli at 12 o'clock position, caudally is clival recess at 6 o'clock position, optic protuberance at 10 and 2 o'clock position, 
carotid protuberances at 5 and 7 o'clock position and cavernous sinuses at 3 and 9 o'clock position. So, if you are conversant with this anatomy, you are less likely to have problems and this is the thing you see. Here the sphenoid septa is paramedial, the internal septa of the sphenoid is paramedial. Now, a medium sized burr of 3 to 4 millimeter is used to drill the cella and it is a gentle lazy drilling. If you drill it, it will enter into the dura. So, a gentle lazy drilling with diamond burr under low speed is done. Egg shell is produced and which is dissected and broken with fine spade dissector. And the extent of cellar bone removal is that you should be able to see four blue lines means superior intercavernous sinus, inferior intercavernous sinus and both cavernous sinuses on both sides. And now this is the cellar floor is being drilled, this is the enlarged cella in a patient. Now mucosa on the posterior side of sphenoid sinus is not stripped, it is just coagulated because stripping causes bleeding. Repeated warm saline irrigation stops bleeding at this stage and clean the field. A, a small hole is made in the inferior lateral part or center of the cella and the anterior wall of the cella and floor is removed circumferentially and dura is coagulated and opened. Now you may open dura in a linear way but mind it and keep it in mind that superiorly the arachnoid may bulge in front of tumor and you may produce a CSF leak. So just avoid the superior part. We usually use a cruciate incision but the disadvantage of this is that it exposes whole of the tumor in one go and if it is a large tumor then part of it may be missed by doing surgery. So this is a linear incision with a retractable copper bank knife, endoscopic knife. So the knife comes only when you are in. And now one more important this copper bank knife is a very long straight handle. So again you have no control. So open the dura in the center of the cella and then either you cut it by the scissors or you make it the incision in the periphery and then you go because you will not have a control. So you may cut cavernous sinus if it is exposed by this knife. And I usually prefer to open dura like this. First make a central and then two cuts at 5 and 8 o'clock position and raise an inferior flap. So advantage of this is that you remove the basal posterior and lateral part of the tumor first and the half of the dura which is not open it acts as a retractor and it supports the superior and anterior part of the tumor. So once you have removed the posterior and lateral part then only you extend these incisions and then you remove the superior and lateral part. And this is how the dura is opened first open in the center and then make cuts. Now the, when you open the dura, cut the dura only not the tumor capsule and then develop a plane between the tumor capsule and dura and make it in flaps. This we have already covered, the basal part is removed and now do not pull the tumor towards the scope otherwise you will soil your lens. So what you do is when you hold the tumor move it sideways other side so that you see that something is not adherent there. So always do a dissection on the sides. Now, for removal of the tumor, the tumor first should be mobilized free and then put into the suction. So mobilize it free and then you take your suction so it sucks it off. Now the rostral part of the tumor is removed circumferentially from periphery towards the center and progressively descending supracellular tumor is continuously removed concentrically. Now a tumor decompression is done by bimanual dissection and a curate is held in the left hand or by double suction method where two suctions are used and left sided suction is used to retract the dura or dural flap and then you suck it by right sided suction. Now after <coughs> gross total removal you take the endoscope to the target study details and withdraw your instruments. So now you do a first do a detailed study. Now you withdraw the endoscope and take your instruments further, remove the tumor. So it is a dynamic process that you see the details of it, remove it, then again take it like this. And there is the tumor you can see. Now normal pituitary is yellowish in color, firm in consistency and there is vascularity present on this. And normal pituitary it should always be predicted in a pre-operative MRI that whether it is post posterior or anterior or down or whatever. And a normal and thinned out pituitary appears as a apron plastered to the under surface of the diaphragm which should be identified and preserved. Now in functioning microadenomas, a thin shell of normal pituitary is shaved 
along with the tumor to increase or to enhance the chances of cure. Now, angled endoscope is taken into the cella to examine the tumor remnants which are removed with curved curates under direct vision. To examine the medial cavernous wall, when you rotate 30 degree endoscope, ask the assistant to rotate the camera as well, so that you are properly oriented all the time. Now, space between the postericlinoid and carotid siphon, which is like a reverse S, represents the ideal entry point for removal of tumor from posterior segment of the cavernous sinus. Now, finally, inspection of cella is done in clockwise fashion, starting with 6 o'clock position using a 30 degree endoscope. So, you see and go all around and visualize the whole cavity. Now, push the diaphragm with cotton and remove the tumor using curved suction from the recesses under the diaphragm by using 40 degree endoscope. Now, arachnoid may bulge down to diaphragm in front of thin pituitary, again caution CSF leak. The last piece of tumor is often located at the site of insertion of pituitary stalk. The most common sites which are found to retain tumor is the angle between optic nerve and carotid artery at medial OCR and under the anterior lip of the dura at the level of superior intercavernous sinus. Now, this is after complete excision, the arachnoid is bulged. Now, a failure of diaphragm descent indicates that there is some retained tumor in the supracellular cistern and pulsations visible in the diaphragm is a robust finding of a total tumor removal. No foreign material should be left in the sphenoid sinus. Intact residual mucosa keeps the sphenoid sinus as an air filled cavity and it is more physiological. If whole of the sphenoid sinus is to be packed because there is a copious CSF leak, in that case you must take out all the sphenoid mucosa, otherwise there will be mucosal formation later on. To avoid crusting, leave minimal raw surface of the bone. And now middle terminate is pushed back to normal position and this helps is or rather it is essential to keep the maxillary because you have lateralized it. So, it is essential to keep the maxillary sinus open and this is after complete excision the fat is placed there and instead of a small pieces a single or a large fat piece should be used. You may use the bone pieces for reconstruction of cella or you can use a rescue flap. So, now we use rescue flap so that CSF leak is not there. Lumbar drain depend on individual choice. If arachnoid tear occurs, should be avoided at all costs, but if occurs, then prevent further opening of the arachnoid, seal it immediately with glue and keep one patty over it, over the defect so that blood does not go in and cause various vasospasm later. In the end, while salva to see for CSF leak. And in macroadenomas, the tumor cavity is filled with fat because it prevents empty cella syndrome formation and it prevents the rupture of the arachnoid which can occur later during extubation in post-operative period and no nozzle packs are used. So, these are just two, three small videos which show you all the possible techniques which have been used. This is the kuana. Now, going up, you see the sphenoid ostia there. And now you coagulate the mucosa medial to the ostia and make a cut and now you dissect the rostrum. Now septum has been pushed to other side and is the submucosal dissection of other side and now you see the ostia of other side. Now you remove the rostrum and now you see the cella, you can see the midline cellar septum. Now, the cellar opening is gradually enlarged. Now, the dura is being opened. And now, you can see the pituitary tumor being taken for biopsy and then use the curates and first remove the inferior basal part, posterior part and then the lateral part. And you, here you can use the double suction method also. It, if it is suckable, it the suction dissects it very well. And never pull it, just give it tra traction. So, like this, you just give it traction. Yeah, and now you see the normal pituitary, this white is. And you always tend to look around that nothing is adherent to. The,
and gentle delivery it's uh, and this is after the complete excision and normal pituitary preserved and this is the fat which is being packed and always see that once you pack the fat it should be pulsating it means you should not be over enthusiastic of packing the cellar and then we put a glue there and push back the middle terminate. This is the other side middle terminate which is replaced back. Now just small videos and this is the cavity and half. You see now this this has been opened uh, bullet models. And now here we started using the flap, a small flap which is sufficient enough to cover the pituitary uh, fossa. And the dissection on the other side. Now you see the rostrum, submucosal dissection of the other side. Both the osti are seen and the vomer is seen, and rostrum is seen. Now this rostrum is removed. Now we remove drill with the drill rather than with the forceps. And now you see this is the cellar, and this is the septum which has been removed. Now with the upcut, the cellar is opening is being enlarged and now this is thin cellar so you can just with the dissector only you can push it. Now this is the whole dura is exposed and now earlier I used to open it just linear incisions on both sides and remove the part of the tumor that so and once you remove the lateral and posterior part then only cut this uh, central dura to remove the other portion. This is for biopsy, then we use the curate and then remove the lateral parts. And now once this lateral and posterior part is removed, now we cut this dura again and reflect it superiorly. And now you see the whole of the tumor which is uh, anterior part and superior part which can be removed. And now we still see it may bulge like this, but again you have to be very careful in dissecting otherwise you may produce arachnoid tear. And if you can prevent carotid injury and arachnoid tear, your whole of the surgery is very good. You will not have any lethal complications because of that. And now you see here the capsule of the tumor which is being dissected from the arachnoid. You can see the intact arachnoid. And this is the difference between normal pituitary and tumor. The tumor capsule will peel off, whereas the normal pituitary will not. So now after complete excision, whatever remains is the pituitary. And now I see some tumor in the posterior basal part, so removed it further. And now see, you can see the further tumor and now this is the complete excision with normal pituitary preserved there. And then same thing, fat is packed there, but again not to pack it too tight. And this is a bathtub technique, if you large piece of fat you put in there and just withdraw it little bit so that all margin from all sides it will seal it and then you put the glue. Keep the patient in hospital for antibiotic for 5 days and ENT referral only if there are some persistent complaints and if there is unsuspected post-op leak in the post-op period the best way to treat it is to repack the it is concluded that the majority of post-operative complications can be avoided by gradual transition from macroscopic to endoscopic surgery, by proper selection of cases, acquiring hand-eye coordination and endoscopic surgical skills, by gentle handling of the mucosa, by spending time in sphenoethmoidal recess widening, recognition of important landmarks during each stage of surgery, bimanual dissection and sequential tumor excision under vision by using extended approach in large supracellar or giant adenomas by avoidance of arachnoid tear and by preserving the normal pituitary.
Thank you very much for your presentation.